Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. April Fools! <laughs> <laughs> Poisson d'Avril! <laughs> And that's what we're going to be talking about today is the origin of April Fool's Day, the drink, the Tom Collins, and hoaxes throughout history. Indeed. So we don't have anything to do, I think, before we get to straight to it, mm-hmm. other than to talk about our cocktails, which seems a little <laughs> beside the point, but then it won't be in the voiceover that we listen to. That's true. So, I mean, the yeah, the topic starts off with the cocktail, the Tom Collins, which is therefore what we're drinking. So just to explain what a Tom Collins is, if you've never had one, it's basically a sort of spiked lemonade. Yeah, boozy lemonade. Boozy yeah. lemonade. Tom's hard lemonade. Ha ha ha. As I joked earlier. <laughs> so it, it's, it's done with gin, some sugar syrup, uh, simple syrup, and lemon juice. And then you... Top it up with with soda water. Mm-hmm. The only sort of slight twist is that the gin is usually, or at least ideally, old Tom gin. Yes, which you may rather not... than London dry gin. Yeah. yeah. So depending on where you are, this may or may not be easily available. Uh, they may not even do it that way in bars, depending on where you are. But but ideally, it should be done with old Tom gin, which went out of fashion for a long time and wasn't available. But now there's. Uh, it was reintroduced by the company Heyman, which is the kind of gin we used. And then I think there's some other companies that have started doing the old Tom style. It's a sweeter style mm-hmm. and less juniper than um, London dry gin, which is the standard gin, though now there's also American style gin, which is neither London dry or old Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we've made. So cheers. Cheers. Yep. Tastes like lemonade <laughs> with some gin in it. And that's not a criticism. It's a refreshing drink. It's really more of a summer drink yeah. than uh, March with s- two and a half feet of snow still on the ground drink, which is what it's like here. <laughs> well, or well, April. Sorry. April. It's April. <laughs> yes. We'll hope that by April 1st, First. it's actually... <laughs> yeah. Well, if the last few years is anything to go by, there will be a large snowstorm no, on April, April 1st, 1st because yes. we've had an April Fool's Day snowstorm mm-hmm. at least the last three years. So, yeah. So I hope all of you who are not in Northern Ontario are having a better spring. <laughs> all right. Shall we get to the voiceover? Sure. So this is going to be a history of the Tom Collins and April Fool's Day. Yes. And then we'll come back and you've got a bunch more details you wanted to add about things that yes. you cut yeah. out of the video, exactly. <laughs> basically, and some other stuff. The drink we now know is the Tom Collins, gin, lemon juice, sugar, and soda water, was probably originally invented by and named after one John Collins, bartender at Limmer's Hotel in West London in the early decades of the 19th century. A rhyme written by Charles and Frank Sheridan, grandsons of the more famous playwright Richard Sheridan, identifies the bartender as the inventor of a popular gin punch, which sounds very much like the Tom Collins of today. So why the change of name? Well, it might be that the drink came to be made with a particular type of sweet gin popular at the time, called Old Tom. So called either because of the black cat, think Tomcat, signs that marked out illicit sellers of the beverage, or because it was named after Thomas Chamberlain of the Hodges Distillery, who supposedly invented it in the late 18th century. Either way, by the time the drink made its first appearance in the 1876 cocktail recipe book by American celebrity bartender Jerry Thomas, the name change had occurred. Or an odd hoax, which was somewhat inexplicably all the rage in 1874 in America, might be responsible for this change from John to Tom. More of a practical joke than a hoax, really. The prankster tells the target that this guy, Tom Collins, and no one knows why that name was always used, has been bad-mouthing him and that he's just around the corner. All worked up, the butt of the joke storms off around the corner to find that jerk Collins, and when there's no such person, well, hilarity apparently ensues. Guess you had to be there. And that's why the Tom Collins is the drink for a day devoted to hoax, pranks, and practical jokes. And this brings us to that larger topic. We're all familiar with crop circles, for instance, and celebrity death hoaxes on the internet. Probably the most famous celebrity death hoax predates the internet, however, the notorious Paul is Dead rumor of the 1960s. But the phenomenon goes back even farther, 
with perhaps the earliest example being when satirist Jonathan Swift, under the pseudonym Isaac Bickerstaff, took a pot shot at astrology by predicting that then-famed astrologer John Partridge would die on April 1st, 1708. Though the man wasn't actually dead, he was widely believed to be, and the hoax ended up irreparably damaging the astrologer's reputation. So, it seems when it comes to hoaxes and pranks, we're never going to give them up, and they're never going to let us down. Speaking of jokes, hoaxes, and pranks, the word joke comes from Latin yokus, with a similar meaning, going back to a Proto-Indo-European root yek, meaning to speak. As for hoax, it either comes from the same Latin root, or it's a contraction of hocus, as in hocus pocus, the fake Latin phrase a magician might use, derived perhaps from hoc est corpus, from the text of the mass. The etymology of prank is uncertain, but one suggestion is that it comes from a Dutch root meaning to adorn, flaunt, make a show, going back to Proto-Germanic meaning press or squeeze. Practical jokes and hoaxes have been around forever, of course, but the specific forms they take and the fascination they hold for onlookers often reflect their particular historical moments or social conditions. A standard modern prank is the prank pizza call, sending a big order of pizza to either a non-existent address or to a friend you're trying to prank, who is then on the hook for paying for all that unwanted pizza. But that's just plain amateurish compared to the 19th century version, the most famous of which is the Berners Street hoax. In 1810, prankster Theodore Hook bet his buddy Samuel Beasley that he could make any address in London the most talked about house in town in a week. He won the bet by sending dozens upon dozens of tradesmen to one house on Berners Street on the same day. Chimney sweeps, coal deliveries, cake makers, doctors, lawyers, shoemakers, fishmongers, furniture deliveries, and more. Including a dozen pianos, which certainly beats a dozen pizzas. Even the Governor of the Bank of England, the Chairman of the East India Company, the Duke of Gloucester, and the Mayor of London were called to the house. Poor Mrs. Tottenham of 54 Berners Street. Traffic was snarled, and the street was filled with gawkers, and the prank highlighted the changing nature of London itself in the 19th century as people flooded in from the country and adapted to the chaos of city living. As for Theodore Hook himself, he had a reputation as a notorious prankster, and has the dubious honour of having sent, to himself, the first postcard in postal history, with a caricature of postal workers on the front as a joke on the mail service. Funny guy, eh? Another notoriously eccentric prankster was Horace de Vere Cole. In a hoax that made the papers, perhaps in part because it so pointedly mocked the pomposity and ignorant imperialism of military officials, he and several friends, including a young Virginia wolf dressed in drag, posed as dignitaries from Abyssinia and got themselves an official reception on board the flagship HMS Dreadnought. When it came time for refreshments, however, they had to make a quick escape, as they'd been warned by the famous actress Sarah Bernhardt's makeup artist who assisted with the gag that their face paint would come off. Sometimes celebrity can help sell a hoax, even if the celebrity in question isn't involved. In 1835, the New York Sun, capitalizing on that age of fantastic scientific discovery and innovation, published a series of articles that claimed famed and respected astronomer John Herschel had, by means of an immense telescope of entirely new principle, discovered life and even an advanced civilization on the moon. The story was a complete fabrication, which Herschel was unaware of until months later. Initially amused by the hoax, Herschel later became annoyed at having to answer repeated questions about it. One who was annoyed immediately was writer Edgar Allan Poe, who accused the paper of plagiarizing his own moon hoax a few months earlier, pointing out that the likely perpetrator of the hoax was Richard Adam Locke, writer for The Sun, who had previously been Poe's editor. Poe had the last laugh, though, by, some years later, publishing his own successful hoax in the New York Sun about a cross-Atlantic balloon voyage, thus, I suppose, recouping some of his lost royalties. Over the years, there have been many literary hoaxes as well. Teenage 18th century poet Thomas Chatterton produced rather convincingly medieval-sounding poetry under the name Thomas Rowley, and ended up being a major influence on the English Romantic movement. Even more influential on the Romantic movement was the epic poetry of the Scot Ossian from the 3rd century. Except it wasn't from the 3rd century, but was largely forged by 18th century schoolmaster James Macpherson. Most were taken in by the forgery, but not the great lexicographer Samuel Johnson, who set about disproving the Ossian poems as fakes. Indeed, writers can be both debunkers and dupes in historical hoaxes. One such example is the story of the ghost of Cock Lane, a street so named because it was the site of legal brothels during the Middle Ages. In 1762, William Kent and Fanny Lines became lodgers in the London home of Richard Parsons. He was a rather overbearing landlord and forced a loan out of Kent, which he then refused to pay back. While staying at the house, Fanny heard an otherworldly scratching noise. The couple left the apparently haunted house, and soon after Fanny died of smallpox. 
When Kent brought successful legal action against Parsons to recover the debt, Parsons claimed that the scratching noise had returned and was now Fanny's ghost accusing Kent of her murder, and the story of scratching Fanny spread through London like wildfire, with gawkers, seances, and even concession stands generating a tidy profit for Parsons. It attracted the attention of the rather credulous gothic novel writer Horace Walpole, as well as the rather skeptical Samuel Johnson, who once again debunked the hoax, and Parsons and some others were tried and convicted for it. Dr. Johnson, 18th Century Ghostbuster. Another overly credulous author was, surprisingly, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, the epitome of rationalism. Doyle was actually an avowed spiritualist and believed in the supernatural, much to the consternation of his sometimes friend Harry Houdini, who, in spite of, or perhaps because of his profession, took up the debunking cause, even at the cost of his friendship with the famous writer. Houdini even hired horror writer H.P. Lovecraft to ghostwrite, if I can use that phrase with a straight face in this context, a book debunking the supernatural. And as for Doyle, one of the hoaxes he was caught up in and promoted with some vigor was the famous case of the photographs of the Cottingley fairies. Turns out they were simply cardboard cutouts made and photographed by the two young girls, Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths, between 1917 and 1920. But it's possible Doyle got his revenge on the doubters and haters. For years, scientists searched for an example of the missing link between ape and human, and they thought they'd discovered it in the Piltdown Man skull, supposedly found by fossil collector Charles Dawson in 1912. Turns out it was the upper part of a human skull joined with the jawbone of an orangutan, a cleverly constructed forgery that wasn't disproved until 1953. It's unknown who the perpetrator was, but the list of suspects includes Dawson himself, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and Horace de Vere Cole, that inveterate prankster behind the dreadnought hoax. Either way, it seems to have been intended as a joke on the scientific establishment that got out of hand. Sometimes the establishment can be behind the hoax, as in the case of the April Fool's Day joke pulled by the BBC news show Panorama that convinced many viewers in 1957 that spaghetti grew on trees and that nothing beat freshly harvested pasta. Many later wrote in asking how they could go about starting their own spaghetti trees. Well, it was the 1950s, and spaghetti was still a somewhat exotic cuisine in England. But for many people, April Fool's is about practical jokes, like that old standard, the Joy Buzzer, a concealed device which vibrated, surprising the receiver of a handshake, invented by the king of novelty devices, Soren Sorensen Adams. Sam Adams, as he was called, who, by the way, turned down the whoopee cushion as too crude, also invented the dribble glass. Maybe an appropriate glass for a Tom Collins? Except that he sort of didn't. Invent it, that is. The concept actually goes back, apparently, to the ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras. The Pythagorean cup, though, works on a slightly different principle. It operates as a normal cup as long as it isn't overfilled, but if one is greedy and takes too much to drink, it creates a siphon, sucking the entire contents of the cup and pouring it out a hole on the bottom. Everything in moderation, I suppose. As for less philosophically minded jokes, as far back as the 18th century, people would send invitations to witness the non-existent ceremony of the washing of the lions in the moat at the Tower of London on April 1st, a prank that persisted into the 19th century. But how far back does April Fool's Day itself go? There are many theories about the origins of April Fool's Day, none of them entirely convincing, so perhaps the joke's on us. The most widely held theory is that it relates to a calendar reform in France in 1564, the Edict of Roussillon, which moved the official start date of the new year from April 1st to January 1st. Anyone still celebrating on the old day would be mocked by having a paper fish stuck to their back and being called poisson d'avril, which is still the French term for April Fool's. Good joke, eh? Actually, the fish connection might not be as surreal as it initially seems. The explanation is that in spring, the newly hatched fish were so plentiful and young that they were easy to trick with allure, so they were thought of as foolish. And it's been suggested that the spring equinox was already considered a time of revelry and mischief-making, much like the winter solstice. Another theory is that April Fool's Day goes back at least as far as Chaucer in the 14th century. There is a possible association of foolishness and trickery with the date April 1st in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in which he tells an animal fable about the cock, Chanticleer, who is proud and vain, being tricked into singing for the fox, who then snatches him up. The fox is then in turn tricked into calling out by Chanticleer, who makes good his escape. Chaucer seems to date the story to April 1st, so while it's not a clear reference to April Fool's Day as a custom, it may be a possible reflection of the time of year's connection to foolishness. There's an even earlier possible association in the legend of the wise men of Gotham, who purportedly tricked King John out of building a public road through their village by all acting mad, doing such things as trying to drown an eel and trap a cuckoo in a roofless fence. 
Supposedly then, April Fool's Day commemorates this event. And there's a reference to the fools of Gotham in the medieval Townley mystery plays, so there seems to be some genuinely old association there. Many years later, by the way, writer Washington Irving bequeathed the nickname Gotham to New York City, which was later still picked up on as the fictional city in the Batman comic books. I wonder what the Joker would think of that connection. But the most reliable evidence seems to point to a Dutch or German origin, appropriate given the probable origin of the word prank. The earliest clear reference to April Fool's pranking goes back to a 1561 poem by Flemish writer Edouard de Denne, in which a nobleman sends his servant around on a series of fool's errands as a joke on April 1st. Also, in an early English reference to the tradition, 17th century author John Aubrey writes, Fool's Holy Day, we observe it on the 1st of April, and so it is kept in Germany everywhere. What is clear is the etymology of the words April Fool themselves. April comes to English through Latin ultimately from the Greek goddess of love Aphrodite, appropriate since the month is sacred to the equivalent Roman goddess Venus. Fool comes through French from Latin follis, meaning bellows, think windbag or airhead. It goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root meaning to blow, inflate, swell, also giving us such words as ball, balloon, bollocks, and phallus. So, if we think back now on our starting point of the Tom Collins, we might be reminded of the expression Tom Fool or Tom Foolery, Tom being an everyman name, as in Tom, Dick, and Harry, which may lead us to the final moral of this Harry Dog story, a fool's errand you might say, that on April Fool's Day, instead of playing a prank on a friend, make them a Tom Collins, and don't be a dick. So before we do anything else, I should just make a small correction, which was given to us by a comment on the video from Dave H., who says that the town in Nottinghamshire that you pronounced as Gotham is pronounced by the locals as Gotham, and then it became Gotham Certainly by the later. time it got to North America. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the time Mr. Irving renamed New York, as he says. Uh, so... And in one of the pictures in the video, in, fa in fact, the one with the cuckoo, mm -hmm. it says cuckoo and then it has underneath it G-O-T-A-M. Right. So it does, that does suggest it's Gotham mm -hmm. or something like that. So anyway, if we talk about it, we should call it Gotham. Gotham. And that's all I have to correct. <laughs> <laughs> so a bit more etymology. I didn't talk about the, the separate words Tom or the separate names, Tom and Collins. So, so I'll start with that. The name Tom short for Thomas, is actually a biblical name from a Semitic root that means twin. Hmm. Okay. So the root is actually, well, it's unpronounceable because proto-Semitic roots are uh, just consonants, mm -hmm. uh, but it's T-W glottal stop M. T-W glottal stop M. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it produces a common Semitic noun, and I will try to pronounce it, the only thing I'm absolutely certain about is the glottal stops. <laughs> <laughs> Ta am, twin. Okay. So the name Thomas, therefore, either comes from Aramaic or Hebrew. We're not sure which. Okay. So either the Aramaic Tama or the Hebrew To am. Mm -hmm. And it's the name of one of the Goths, uh, disciples, Disciples, right? yeah. yeah. As in doubting. Yes. <laughs> I can't recall whether he had a twin. <laughs> I don't know. You keep talking off. I see if I can figure that out. <laughs> the Apostle Thomas was also known as Didymus, meaning twin. Ah. So while I don't know whether that means he actually did have a twin or was a twin, but the the name Thomas was certainly meant to refer to twin, twin, or was right. or was understood to refer to twin right. anyhow by those who were writing the Gospels, because he's also known as Thomas Didymus, or just as Didymus. Okay. Well, speaking of twins, there are, there are of course, hoaxes involving twins. In fact, it's a, it's a, a literary uh, mm -hmm. kind of trope, most famously The Prince and the Pauper, where you have, you know, they, they look identical and they switch places. Right. right. And the sort of more modern example that I can think of is The Parent Trap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of any other twin stories? Oh, of of like that. Well, there's the twin hoaxings where they switch places, kind of thing. Do they have to actually be twins? Because the prince and the pauper aren't aren't actually twins. And there's yeah, also the it's fictional, but the one that the Doctor Who episode is based on that I'm 
blanking on Ruritania. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, the Doctor Who story is one of the key to time episodes. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're both blanking on it. But I mean, Androids of Tara. Yeah, but, but it's based on a famous... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is based on a famous book. Oh, right. Okay, I looked it up. It's based on The Prisoner of Zenda, and I'm feeling right. very silly that I couldn't come up with that. Anyway, so The Prisoner of Zenda is another... It's like The Prince and the Pauper, and it's, well, it's different, but two people who look the same, one who has to pretend to be the, the prince. Right. There's a commoner. I think there's also... Possibly a Disney movie about a girl who has to pretend to be a princess. Oh, yeah. Fairly recent-ish, like within the last 10 yeah, years. Yeah, what was that called? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see it. I mean, that that idea, the doppelganger the rather doppelganger. than the twins, twins. Yeah, yeah. is, uh, you know, comes up from time to time. So anyway, so I can't think of uh, twins, the twin trick. I mean, you know, Full House had the twins and... Um, yeah, but they but were, they played the same. They played the same. So, I mean, that's a that's a common ish thing as having um, twins pl twin children playing Play, one yeah. person on a TV show to make it easier for the yeah to get all the, the scenes. Yeah. So, but I can't think of I don't know. There probably are lots of others, <laughs> and I just can't think of any. Send us your stories. <laughs> So that's the name Tom. As for Collins, it's a diminutive of Nicholas, which comes from, it comes from Greek meaning victory people, two elements there. The first element, Nike, is the goddess of victory who lends her name appropriately to the sportswear company Nike, mm -hmm. which I think, I guess is how people pronounce it. I've heard Nike, Nike. Nike. too, as the name of the company. I don't. That's a North that, American only. Or British only. I've never. I've only heard British people say it, but they don't seem to be no. sure that's how it's pronounced. I mean, in here it's Nike, Nike. for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's all the ads. It's Nike, right? I've never heard anyone really. Anyway, but presumably non-English speakers would pronounce it Nike. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, in Greek, yes, yeah, it's Nike. Yeah. But I mean, that has little to do with how people are going to pronounce a shoe company's name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it comes from, the, it, it's deliberately named after the goddess, yes. of course. Yeah. The second element of Nicholas is Laos, mm -hmm. meaning people. Mm -hmm. And the name Old Nick, referring to the devil, mm -hmm. uh, and the word nickel both come from that, from that name. Now, as for April Fool's Day itself, I have a few more details about the origins so according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the earliest use of the phrase April Fool is from 1629 in Edmund Lechmere's A Disputation of the Church Wherein the Old Religion is Maintained. And I'll read you the quote. For my part, I was not willing at the sight of yours, which I espied by mere chance, and never saw but once, to be made an April Fool, and therefore would not be so far at your command." Okay. It's a good quotation, but the <laughs> context is entirely yes. obscure, obscure there. But anyway, yes. that's fine. To be made an April Fool. To be made an April Fool is part. the... Yeah. So it's referring to... Using it to refer to a person. Right. Right. So the tradition has been in England uh, since at least that time. Mm -hmm. John Aubrey's reference, which I mentioned before, is somewhat later in 1686. So like a good 50 years later. Though it isn't a clear reference to April Fool's Day itself, the earliest use of the French phrase passant d'avril is apparently from 1508 in the poem Le Livre de la Diablerie by the French composer Eloi Damerval. So that predates the, the phrase in April Fool's. In English. In English. Now, in that insert... I was talking about that Chaucer story, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's it's specifically from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the nun's priest's tale. Right. And in that tale, the fox, as I say, tricks the cock and the cock tricks the fox. So they both act foolishly. It's this sort of... Right. They're both, they're both the butt of a trick. They're both the butt of a trick. Yeah. And there is a specific reference to folly at in the moral at the end of the story. So right. that is... You know, kind of, sort of the point of yeah. it. Yeah. Now, I said he seemed to date the story to April 1st. Oh, I have a vague memory of this. It has to do with astrology, it, it, doesn't it? Astronomy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's slightly complicated. I will try to explain it. Chaucer, by the way, was really into astronomy and working out, you know, the stars and the dates and all of this kind of 
thing. He wrote a treatise on the astrolab and and he sprinkles references to that sort of stuff in his poems. So this is a favorite subject of his. Um, so you'd think he'd get it right. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. So he establishes the date for the story in a rather roundabout and perhaps intentionally foolish way. This is how I read it. <laughs> I'm all about getting meta with poets. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll read the passage and then I'll talk about how, how it's it been interpreted. <laughs> Should I just read it in, in sort of uh, translate into modern English or do you want to hear me read it in Middle English? Please read it in Middle English. Okay. I can always cut it out if it gets annoying. <laughs> When that the month in which the world began, that Hichte March, when God first marked man, was complete, and passed where also Sin March began, thirty days and two. All right, and now translate that okay. for the tiny fraction of our audience that are not <laughs> fluently used to Middle English. When that the month in which the world began, that is called March, when God first made man, was complete, and past were also, since March began, 30 days and two. So, in other words, 32 days since March began, that would be April 1st. Right. Right? Now, the tricky bit is that in the following passage, it gives a complex astrological indication that there are more, that's more in keeping with a date sometime in May. Hmm. So... Specifically, the passage says, Befell that Chanticleer, in all his pride, his seven weaves, walking by his seed, cast up his ain to the bricht sonne that in the scene of Taurus had Irona, twenty degrees and on, and somewhat more, and knew be kinder, and be known of a lore, that it was prime and cru with blissful stevener. So, I will translate once again. <laughs> I like the way you look up at me like, see? Proven. <laughs> uh-huh. So it it befell, it, it happened that Chanticleer, in all his pride, his seven wives walking by his side, cast up his eyes to the bright sun that in the sign of Taurus had run 20 degrees and one, and somewhat more. And he knew by nature and by no other learning that it was prime and crew with blissful voice. Prime being the time of day. Yeah. First hour. Yeah. Which means sunrise. Yes. All of those things are not obvious. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so we're talking about the sign of Taurus mm -hmm. and 20 degree, 21 degrees and maybe somewhat more. It was, so that's when the, the hour of prime fell. Anyways. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, the yeah, hour, the hour prime, prime actually does, doesn't really matter. I mean, and that's what's foolish about it, right? Yeah. Like he wouldn't need to look and figure out where the sun was in, in what consulate, like in what house it was rising in order that's to true. know that it was sunrise. Mm -hmm. So that's surely part of the weirdness of it. Yeah. The astrology has nothing to do with whether you can tell it's sunrise or not. Right. But if the if the sign of Taurus had run 20 degrees and one, mm -hmm. that can't be April. That can't be early April. We have to be into May for that. Sure. Because that's be when case. Taurus again, is. I'm, I'm not an expert in <laughs> astrology. I told you it was astrology, not astronomy. <laughs> I well, mean, I know you're a Taurus anything. and you have a birthday in yes. May, so that's yeah. the only piece of information I have to hang on. Yes. The, but I'll I'll take the word of those who know what they're talking about <laughs> for the fact that this should mean May. Should mean May. 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 Right. Yeah. So now, apparently, this information, if you account for the 12 days offset because of the change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar... <laughs> of course, because it couldn't be that simple, could it? <laughs> would, ...would yield the date of May 3rd. Okay. Now... Many editors, therefore, amend the text in the earlier passage that I read to, since March was gone, 30 days and two, right? Oh, so, so end of 30, March, day, 30 days and two plus. Yeah, rather than 30. since March began. And that would give us that March 3rd date as well. Right. So that would seem to, to make sense. But they have to change the But they the have to change the to text. do that. Now, the other sort of detail in favor of that emendation is that this date, May 3rd, is a date that Chaucer actually mentions in other contexts as well. So it is often referred to as his favorite date <laughs> for some reason. We don't know exactly why, but it comes Maybe up again and again. Is it his birthday? Ooh, good question. I don't know that we know that. <laughs> it's the only kind of favorite date I could have. Right. right? Like, I don't know what other... Do you have a favorite date? I mean, Maybe <laughs> is that a date you have as a favorite? Yeah. Fell in love on that date or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a wedding anniversary. Yeah. 
Anyways, what I wonder, though, is how much would this be off because of orbital precession in the 600 plus <laughs> years since Chaucer's time? Surely people have thought about that, have they not? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that's the sort of thing people in the 19th century spent all their time I'm thinking doing. about. <laughs> so I, I, I had a rough guess at what that would be, and it would be out by over a week. Now, it still I'm, wouldn't get you back to April 1st, though. No. Now, I'm no... Astrological again, no expert. <laughs> <astrologist> <laughs> expert. Uh, perhaps someone with more astronomical knowledge than I have can work this out, what the difference is between, you know, uh, right. 14th century and when that would be in the 14th century and when that would be now. Uh by all means, let us know if you, <laughs> you can do that sort of calculation. And if right now you're thinking, oh, my God, I knew, we care? I knew scholars re <laughs> were concerned of our ridiculous things, but I didn't know how ridiculous they were. Yes, you're right. <laughs> mm. Well, the argument against making an emendation is that all the manuscripts that exist of this agree on the, the, the reading since March began. Right. And I'm always inclined not to make an emendation if it works. Like it's a last resort, yeah, right? To it's make the, an emendation. The last div difficilior. You go with the hard to explain reading in the manuscript because the they knew more than, than we do. Well, so. and also emending for content always yeah. feels. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm not, uh, you're not an astrological expert. I'm not a manuscript expert. I'm really not. I mostly do leave these things up to other people. But it's one thing to emend for grammar. Mm -hmm. And for literal sense, like yeah. the, like the sense grammar, I mean, they were native speakers. Yeah, no, I know, but 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 the kind of grammar where you can see how like an ending could get shifted in writing yeah. or if misreading it's, if it's a that kind of sort of error. Yeah, yeah, those kinds of things, fine. Or where you simply cannot, like it's 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 nonsense. It's nonsense. Where where yeah. a sentence you're like, there's no verb here, or there's right. no, or there's four verbs that don't match or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, there's sometimes when it's it's just literally nonsensical. But if it's sensible and it rhymes and it has the right meter and all of those things and it's just on content, that does make me suspicious. Mm -hmm. Because then you're just saying, well, I think I know what he meant to say. And that's always tough. Yeah. And what I figure is, since this is this is a tale that contains a rooster and a chicken debating the philosophy of predestination and prophetic dreams, perhaps this dating is supposed to be inconsistent and kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, indeed, and and that, that, that line about joke. and that line about he knew by nature and no learning. Yeah, what yeah. time it was, and that he shouldn't need to know the astrological. Like that does cast doubt on his astrological. I mean, like. <laughs> I'd be more inclined to say that we should expect his astrological knowledge to be wrong since he signposts it right there. He says he knows this by nature and not learning. Mm -hmm. So then he might well get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. He signposts that the rooster doesn't actually understand right. astrology. He's just an animal yeah. who is talking about philosophy. And what does he know about philosophy? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. But also not a Chaucer expert. <laughs> I'm not an expert in anything we are discussing. <laughs> well, and it seems to me that this is just the sort of nerdy joke that Chaucer would might make, yeah. might make yeah, and yeah. like no one would get it except for like one person. And yeah, <laughs> that's who he's, he was aiming the joke at. So, yeah. yeah, seems possible. All right. So he may or may not be talking about April Fool's Day. No, nobody's thinking, unlike with the argument about Valentine's Day. Nobody's suggesting it was because of him that April Fool's Day. This would only be evidence for it already existing in his time. Yeah, or right? some, not necessarily April Fool's Day, but some association of, of that time of year with, with foolishness. foolishness. Yeah, so that's all, but nobody's suggesting yeah. that it comes from him. No. One way or the yeah. other. Yeah. Though, since you bring up Valentine's Day, if you've listened to our episode on Cuckold, and I forgot to write down the episode number for this one, no, if I didn't put it in the show notes. All right. Yeah. So take it as you will. I think, you know, it is interesting that uh, Valentine's Day it also owes its origins to a confused date in a Chaucer poem. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Or maybe Chaucer's just pranking us and we're... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's sort of what you're suggesting, yeah, right? Is yeah. that he's making a joke. Okay. So yeah, that um, that other Chaucer poem, the Valentine's related one, is the Parliament of Fowls. And it was in our, as I, as we said, the the episode on cuckold, which is comes from the bird cuckoo. And speaking of cuckolds and cuckoos, mm -hmm. there is another connection here to that uh, to Chaucer and that cuckold video because, or that chuck, uh, that um, cuckold well video and podcast episode, because in the Wise Men of Gotham, mm -hmm. very good. <laughs> <laughs> in that story, we hear about the foolish attempts to fence in a cuckoo bird. Right. 
with a roofless enclosure. Yes. <laughs> And what's more, the cuckoo bird makes another appearance in the Scottish April Fool's tradition, mm -hmm. where April 1st was, and perhaps still is, known as Hunt the Gauk Day. And yes, I may not be pronouncing that correctly, but... It would be nice if, if any of you know whether this is still a thing. Mm -hmm. So the word gauk is the Scottish and Northern English word for, for the cuckoo bird, and is related to the Old English word yak which is the old English word for cuckoo. Oh, right. Yes. I was, I was sort of suddenly had a vision of Tibetan domesticated animals. <laughs> Yaks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we get that, that modern word, you know, that's used in both Scotland and in Northern English mm -hmm. from that old English word. And the, the word gauk is also the Scots word for a foolish person. Right. Okay. So they call foolish people cuckoos, which sort of makes sense, I mm -hmm. guess. And there is a sort of traditional prank that you do in Scotland on that day, do or did. Okay. You ask someone to deliver a sealed message that supposedly requests help with something, but the message actually says, and I'm not going to attempt a... Do not a attempt a Scottish, Scottish accent. accent here. That would be deeply offensive. Yes. yes. <laughs> dinna laugh, dinna smile. Hunt the gauk another mile. Okay. The recipient then explains that they can only help if they first contact another person. Oh, right. So you keep sending... And sends the victim to the next person with the identical message, right. and the chain continues. And you see how long it goes. Before the guy... Before the person's like, what is going on? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, what japes. I know. People... <laughs> before there was TV, people had such creativity, <laughs> or were satisfied with such a low bar of humor. <laughs> exactly. And even more... The Scottish, that Scottish tradition also continues the celebration an extra day so that on April 2nd, that's called tail day, when you stick a paper tail on people's back, which is sort of rep reminiscent of that fish, the paper and fish. Poisson fish, uh, yeah. Poisson d'Avril, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there does seem to be some cluster of connections going on here, mm -hmm. for what it's worth. Right. That Scots word gawk, cuckoo or fool, might be related to gawky and gawk. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that. Yeah, It's not certain, but it has been posed. Because to gawk is to sort of stare foolishly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and gawky is sort of... Yeah, yeah. You know, kind of... A little laughable, basically. Yeah. So, and that reminds us of the, the various gawkers that the hoax is often attracted, right. as I said. So, right. kind of a nice little... Tie in. Tie in there. Right. Now, there have been historically various events that have been connected to April Fool's Day. Some probably, well, most, if not all, uh, just coincidental, but people have tried to make connections. So in addition to King jo that King John Godam story, there are other events mm -hmm. uh, that potentially connect up. One that the Dutch really hold to is the capture of the town Den Briel. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but it's a town in, in the, the Netherlands that was that had been under the control of the Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, under the Spanish Duke Alvarez de Toledo. De Toledo. Sure. <laughs> yes, Toledo. Toledo. Be, yes. Should be pronounced. And the Dutch recaptured that town mm -hmm. on April 1st, 1572, mm -hmm. which resulted in a Dutch proverb and I will just read it in translation. <laughs> yes. Because I'm a coward. Also because I forgot to look up, look up the, all the words. <laughs> look up the pronunciation of the words. So it, it basically means on the 1st of April, Alva lost his glasses. And there's a pun in there. Mm -hmm. So we do have to get into a bit of the, the actual Dutch because the town name Briel sounds similar to the word Brill, which means glasses. Okay. So right, so he lost his he town. He lost his town. He lost, he lost that his town, glasses. He lost his glasses. Yes. And so many Dutch people, I think, believe that that's where the custom of April Fools comes from. I don't know if they actually believe it or not, but it's been linked it, to it, that. It has been linked to that. Yeah. But our sources for April Fools' Day come from before that date. Well, that's a pretty early date. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, like, is there seventy two? It's certainly before the English April Fools' right, stuff, because right. that's all quite late. But the French, I guess, predates it. Yeah, the French Poisson d'Avril is first first appears in print in 1508. Right, so that's so quite a ways. A, that's before quite a ways that. before. Yeah. So if that's connected to etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah. Right. Okay. But of course, 
we don't really know. No, where I know this is all money. All, I'm just yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to keep it's very hard to keep this mm-hmm. timeline in my head, so I'm just trying to to keep it there. Okay. Now it's possible, and here we move into the realm of conjecture. Mm. More conjecture More than conjecture. we've already got. That the whole tradition reaches back to some sort of misrule festival, which often takes place in the spring. A lot of different cultures have this kind of connection. So there is the the Roman festival of Hilaria, which you will tell us about in a minute. But there's little direct evidence to support these kinds of links. Yeah. The continuity is really hard to pinpoint. Like, there was this at this time. There is this. A thousand years later, or more than a thousand yeah, years later, exactly. And there's nothing in between. It's always a, a shaky. And what what there is in between is a complete rejection of the festivals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been argued by Ronald Hutton in the book Stations of the Sun, which is a really good book that talks about various festivals and things right. in, in the English tradition, that as the misrule elements of traditions associated with with, with Christmas. For, primarily, Mm -hmm. uh, which used to have, you know, this Mm -hmm. this rule element, as that faded, there became a greater emphasis on the spring equinox for misrule, misrule. uh, and hence April Fool's Day. Misrule is, in fact, often part of renewal festivals Mm -hmm. in general. So, and and that is similar with the sort of Christmas thing, because that's the the solstice. And you can see this kind of thing in other traditions as well. The the Feast of Fools, Saturnalia, Hilaria, and Holi in the Hindu mm-hmm. tradition. Mm-hmm. And the Persian, in the Persian tradition, there is a festival called Sizda Bedar, mm-hmm. which corresponds to either April 1st or April 2nd, mm-hmm. and partly involves pranks. It's not mainly about that. It's mainly about picnicking in the outdoors. Mm. So it's a sort of outdoor festival day. You leave your house and you join nature and spend the day outdoors and right, eat food and right. that sort of thing. Uh, but there is apparently some element of drinking. Yeah. So, Avon, <laughs> what do you have to tell us about Hilaria? <laughs> well, is it hilarious? A little, a little bit. So yeah, it's a Roman festival and it the celebration starts on March 25th, actually. So mm-hmm. not April 1st, though as with many festivals, it seems to have extended over a period of time. The main day of its celebration was the vernal equinox. Right. And then, and on that day itself, you'd have games and masquerades. There was no sorrow to be shown, only rejoicing. So that's the con- connection with festival, right? Right. Now, what it was a, the, the word hilaria is actually a term that can be used, it seems, in the Roman context that they could use it to mean any festival of either public or private rejoicing. So it could just mean rites of celebration. So you could have private hilaria for a wedding or a birthday, or the emperor could decree days of celebration for some reason, you know, a triumph for somebody recovering from an illness illness or something like that. So there was sort of a general hilaria, but then there was also this particular hilaria, which was an annual festival uh, marked in the calendar. And it was to honor Cybele, who is the great mother, the Magna Mater. She's an Eastern goddess who was imported to Rome in the, I think, third century BC. Mm-hmm. We know of like the specifics of her importation was during a great crisis and they needed help. So they in sibling books told them to import her. Yeah. So her statue slash rock was brought <laughs> was brought to Rome. So she's a sort of non-Roman god who becomes a Roman God and her festival is therefore also imported and in fact seems to basically be imported from a Greek festival known as the Anabasis, which means the coming back up. Mm-hmm. And so what the, the Greek festival celebrates the return of Attis. So Cybele and Attis is a mother goddess and her consort. It's a spring renewal god, dying god story. Wow, okay. Attis is one of the dying gods. And the story is complicated and there are multiple versions. But basically, uh, her lover Attis dies, goes to the underworld, and then comes back or is buried. And then his finger still wiggles or his... not I'm not actually dead. Yeah, no, but like he's still dead, but his finger still wiggles. But one wonders if that finger is really meaning something else that's still wiggling because he is a fertility god. Um, or um, the pomegranate is born from his blood 
Mm. Uh, or other flowers are born from his blood, or a tree, pine tree is born from his blood. There's a bunch of different stories. Uh, anyway, it, it's quite confused in the versions we have of it, but it definitely seems to be mother goddess, dying god, death and return. And so the Greek festival is the Anabasis, and before the Anabasis you have the, the going, the descent, and then the, the catabasis, and then the next day is the anabasis. Okay. So there's a day of mourning and grieving in which, and uh, various types of fasting, and then that, a day and or night, and then the next day is the day of rejoicing and, fest and festivities and hilarity right. and all of that. This sounds a lot like the Persephone. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> the Addis is very strongly connected with the Persephone story in thematic ways, mm -hmm. though not in... Well, even with the... Uh... Pomegranate, pomegranate yeah. yeah. I may be misremembering the connection with the pomegranates. I know that pomegranates are one of the things you can't eat in the days leading up to the hilaria. Uh, but now I'm not sure if Addis actually has to do with pomegranates or not. I'm, I may be misremembering that. There's also uh, a ritual that seems to have to do with planting pine trees, or sorry, cutting pine trees down mm -hmm. on the day before. And then on the day of, you plant them or re put them back up. Uh, so anyway, you you get the point. Right. The point is it's around the spring festival and it's celebrating death and rebirth. Mm -hmm. And so there's this Greek festival, which is celebrating Addis and Cybele, who are really near Eastern gods and goddesses. And then that gets imported into Rome. So they're using it, too. So that's, you know, that's why it's connected to joyousness and games. And it was a time of playing like for games mm -hmm. and masquerade in particular yeah, as yeah. a as a kind of thing you do. But that's, you know, sure. So the celebration around the vernal equinox, I don't think that's strong. There are link a lot of people to, who celebrate around the vernal equinox. I don't think that's a strong link to April Fool's Day. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is that, and that we have some details reconstructed. The trouble is, all of the details we have of the Hilaria come from, I think, the 4th or 5th century AD hmm. by a Christian writer writing yeah. about pagan right. festivals. Sure. So, like, it's always tricky. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Ovid in his Fasti, which is the his poem about the Roman calendar, mm -hmm. we only have six months of it, but March is in there, and he does not mention it at all. He hmm. doesn't mention the Hilaria at all. Now, that might be because it's not a Roman festival, per se. It's a imported festival. But if it was a state festival it's a, and it would be in the fasti, that would be it would be on the calendar. It would be marked right. on the calendar. Sure. So I, I don't I wasn't able to do enough research to find out if people have talked about why. You right. know, Ovid, <laughs> Ovid is not one's first go to for absolutely perfect, <laughs> you know representation of reality i just sure. thought it was interesting you'd think it would be the kind of festival he'd like yeah you know right. it, it's mm -hmm. got mythology it's got weird foreign customs it's got jokes and laughter like it i'm a little surprised it wasn't there so for whatever that means it just i thought i'd mention that he doesn't mention it <laughs> and the word hilaria i didn't actually look up but it comes from a greek it's a roman version of a greek word that means laughter right and obviously we get the word hilarious from yes it, yes so I don't know if we get it from the Roman festival. I think we probably get it from the Greek. Hilaros. Hmm, that's a good question. Let's quickly look that up. It comes through Latin. Oh, okay. But from the Greek word. Yeah. from uh, Specifically from hilaritas. Well, hilarity comes from hilaritas. That's mm -hmm. mid-15th century. So that is earlier than hilarious, which only appears in the 19th century. That may be the earliest version of the... So yes, I mean... It, it comes through Latin from the Greek hilarios, meaning cheerful, merry, joyous, mm -hmm. which probably comes from the Proto-Indo-European root cell, meaning reconcile. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's not obvious. Hmm. Anyway, that's all I have to tell you, tell you about hilaria. So, yes, I, it's one of those ones where you can see the parallels but I strongly doubt, doubt. that yeah, April 1st yeah. Yeah. as April Fool's Day. I mean, it's not even the right date again. Yeah. And I just don't think there's any causal connection. No, I think they probably come from the same, same impulses. Impulse yeah. that, oh, it's spring. It's spring. Let's we be celebrate. Silly. Yeah. We celebrate spring with laughter and joyousness. Yeah. So after making that original video, it sort of occurred to me that there was a sort of underlying theme that I didn't really play up that much. It sort of comes out a bit in some spots, but that there is this, and you'll pardon the very intentional pun. Um, uh, no, I'm not going to pardon it if it's intentional. <laughs> no right. pardon given. That there's this underlying theme of the spirit of the age. Yes. 
so that you know, beyond the cocktail and the the hoaxes and practical jokes themselves, there's this way that hoaxes tend to capture the spirit of the age that they're from, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why they they speak to particular concerns, yeah. or they demonstrate anxieties, mm -hmm. or they re reflect new changes or something like that which is yeah. why you know they the older ones may not seem that funny to us because mm -hmm. we don't have the same preoccupations mm -hmm. and this occurred to me that this is a bit similar to the you know the way that myths and in particular urban legends mm -hmm. uh which we looked at by the way way back in episode seven the story of narrative right they seem to reflect the concerns of the day so an urban legend like the alligators in the sewer reflect fears about the disconnect from nature. Mm -hmm. um, lack of understanding of infrastructure. Lack of understanding of in infrastructure and all the stuff going on beneath your feet that you don't really know about. Mm -hmm. Or the KFC deep fried rat mm -hmm. urban myth that reflect a sort of anxiety about no longer making our own foods anymore mm -hmm. and being disconnected from the means of food production and so forth. So when a hoax captures the public imagination, at least sometimes it's because it's in tune with the zeitgeist and reflects the, the spirit of the age. Spirit, yes. spirit of the age, I was about to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> reflects Just have the, to step on your pun there. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm going to be talking about that for a while now, though. Okay. So yeah, it, it reflects the preoccupations of the time. So that that phrase, the spirit of the age, is in fact a calc. Uh, well, a, a, a specific attempt at translating the German zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. It's a calc of it, though. Really. A calc of it, yeah. yeah. Though there's even closer ones. Okay. Literally, zeitgeist means time spirit, mm -hmm. and it's etymologically equivalent. You know, if we wanted to d even be a, like a an exact calc that was etymologically the same, it would be tide ghost. Mm, right. Time and tide. Is, tide. Is, means, yeah. So tide originally meant time and geist, ghost. Mm -hmm. Now, Thomas Carlyle, the 18th century sort of philosopher, writer, and so forth, he translated it as both time spirit and spirit of time when he referred to it. The German term was actually coined by Johann Gottfried von Herder. He's the guy that we mentioned in our episode recently about Sublime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's the guy That's behind the aesthetics. Sturm und Drang and the Weimar classicism and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Uh, so basically a precursor of Romanticism. Mm -hmm. Carlyle refers to the German word, but it was first used as a sort of loan word in English, zeitgeist, so borrowed actually into, into English, by Matthew Arnold, right, the poet. And just because I like this quote, another quote that the OED uses to demonstrate the use of the word is from Shaw, mm -hmm. George Bernard Shaw, who said, my business is to incarnate the zeitgeist. Very nice. Isn't that good? I like that. It's almost like he was good at words, words or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but who's the first person to say zeitgeisty? Because that you is asked, a good word. <laughs> I will give you the answer. <laughs> I'm just, the, I'm just feeding you lines. Line I'm, just, I'm the straight man feeding you the lines, sweetie. <laughs> when do you guess it was first? It was first used. Well, I mean. The obvious guess, if you hadn't asked me, but now that you've asked me, I'm not going to answer this. The obvious guess would be like in the last 15, 20 years, Buffy, the vampire slayer, would be my guess just on a general, because they were fun, fond of right. play like that. Or it could be in the internet, you know, the social media age or something. Yeah. But since you've asked me when I would guess, I'm going to say 1920. Not that early. <laughs> 1966. Yeah. Zeitgeisty. Right. Yep. So it's probably older than most people realize. Yeah. I bet it's been <laughs> reformed multiple times, though. Perhaps. I, you know, just because it was used first then does not mean that anybody mm -hmm. who used it later did so because they'd heard. they had heard it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I suspect it's the kind of word that gets re mm -hmm. recreated. Okay, good. So there you go. Like I see. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Perfectly legit word. Yep. So that original German word, by mm -hmm. the way, as I said, it was originally used by Herder. But it really became famous because it was picked up by the philosopher Hegel. Right. So Hegel had a specific theory uh, about this for basically understanding history. Herder's comments may have had more to do with, with aesthetics because, you know, that was... That was his preoccupation, his thing. yeah. Though Hegel, when he, he uh, talks about Zeitgeist, he's also largely addressing that as well. He's talking about history, but specifically history of, you know, artistic 
expressions of the examples he uses anyways, mm -hmm. though I think he opens it up into a broader concept. So Hegel's zeitgeist can be seen in, and this is why Carlyle is so important here, because Carlyle had kind of the opposite. And so there was a bit of a debate kind of between these two positions. So Hegel's zeitgeist is in contrast to Carlyle's great man theory, which he expounded on in... Right. Okay. Right. He expanded on this uh, in a book called On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Mm -hmm. So basically, Carlyle's idea is that history operated because there are great men who drive history forward. They have, right. you know, some brilliant new artistic expression or the powerful political ruler or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. these heroes, and that's specifically the word that he uses to, to refer to them. The heroes drive history forward. Now we refer to this as great man history. And that's kind of in opposition to Hegel's idea that it is not individuals, but a more general, general feeling, zeitgeist, zeitgeist right. spirit of the age that moves history forward. So interestingly, though, William James, if you've watched our recent videos, you, you just love William James, <laughs> Henry James. They're all over the place. Yes. yes. He's he, in verse. Both yeah. verse and oh, that's right. Captain Marvel. So he's the guy with a, a theory about emotion that that are physiological reactions are the emotions. Right, right. It's the guy with the bear. The guy with the bear. So he was a big supporter of Carlyle's great man theory. Okay. And I'll probably talk about that more in an upcoming video. So if you <laughs> want to hear more about these two theories and how they work, stay tuned. So a few more details about that Tom Collins hoax and a related hoax to it. It seems that pubs kind of got in on the action of that hoax. So what you would do is you would say, oh, that guy, Tom Collins, he was, you know, bad mouthing you. He's in the pub around the corner. And so <laughs> the victim would go into the pub and say, where's Tom Collins? The bartender would say, oh, he left a little while ago. He's gone over to this other pub. And so you go to the next pub. And what was in pub, it for the, pub? the next pub? Well, eventually the, the, uh, the pub owners stopped redirecting people and would when you asked for Tom Collins they would give you the drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But initially it was the same right. as that other trick, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You, you just send the guy on on this, you know, wild goose chase. There's um, a phrase you haven't looked up. Wild goose chase, that's true. <laughs> Probably it's there was there chasing was, wild geese is hard. But <laughs> there was a podcast episode on that from so Bunny many. Trails. What is okay. it called? Yeah, Bunny Trails. Bunny Trails, yes. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was them, uh, fairly recently. Oh, okay. So, yes, we'll find that and give right. you the link. I'll add that to the list. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep up with it. There are so many language and I etymology know, and podcasts so also now. also good. Yes. So, yes, go listen to them. You'll like it. And it wasn't just pubs getting on, in on the joke. I mean, it was genuinely really popular. And so, I mean, it inspired music hall songs about it, first of all. But... Even the newspapers got in on the joke, reporting sightings of that cad Tom Collins around town. <laughs> See, you're very entertained by this. <laughs> it's a brilliant joke. It gets funnier and funnier the more you think about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, what's even more bizarre is that apparently 1874 was a really good year for hoaxes, especially hoaxes that the newspapers got involved in. Uh -huh. <laughs> because there's another famous hoax from that same year. Okay. <laughs> because this was also the year of the Central Park Zoo Escape hoax. <laughs> was this about penguins taking over the zoo and escaping and helping a man with an umbrella? <laughs> Just asking. Well, so this hoax... This zoo escape hoax was published in the New York Herald. They published a fake article about a zoo escape of many animals causing death and mayhem and only revealing in the final sentence of the very long detailed article that it was untrue. So if you didn't read to the end, you didn't know that it was a joke. And this is proving that even in the 19th century, people hadn't Don't did not have. End. Yeah, didn't well, I guess have it was so alarming. TLDR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Too long. Didn't read. <laughs> And I'll just read you the headline of, because, you know, as I say, it's a long article, but I will read you the headline because it's amusing. Awful calamity. The wild animals broken loose from Central Park. Terrible scenes of mutilation. A shocking Sabbath carnival of death. 
<laughs> Savage Seventh Carnival, oh dear. <laughs> Savage brutes at large. Awful combats between the beasts and the citizens. The killed and the wounded. General Duryea's magnificent police tactics. Bravery and panic. How the catastrophe was brought about. A frightening incidents. Proclamation by the mayor. Governor Dix shoots the Bengal tiger in the street. Consternation in the city. So they hadn't mastered the art of the succinct headline yet. <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, I guess the actual big print part of that was awful calamity. And then in smaller print were all those other <laughs> subheadings. Yes. Yeah. We'll put a, the, the image up on the... Uh... Of course we'll. Let me write that down. <laughs> 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 so so why do they do that just just to just be funny so well the was story... it an april fool's day no, no i don't think okay. so this so the story was actually written by a journalist or writer named joseph ignatius constantine clark but he did it under the instigation of the managing editor thomas b connery who had once seen a near escape of a leopard he liked to walk in in the zoo as sort of pastime and he one time apparently saw a near escape of leopard and gave him the idea, oh, we could do this as a joke. But the newspaper's owner kind of got all the criticism for it, I guess, you know. Yeah. But it was actually kind of reasonable. So the owner of the newspaper is named James Gordon Bennett Jr. So he, he was criticized for spreading panic. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a reasonable criticism given his reputation. Right. It would have been reasonable to assume, reasonable it, was assume it was his fault, even though yes, it because he wasn't. did some crazy things. So first of all, Bennett's father, James Gordon Bennett Sr., started the New York Herald in 1835, which was which soon after became a huge success due to breaking the story of the grisly murder of upscale prostitute Helen Jewett. Okay. So this is is kind of a precursor of the tabloid Right, you know, news right, journalism. Yeah. Major newspapers that at that time didn't really report on these kinds of stories. So because they weren't respectable. And, yeah. yeah. Well, and you didn't bother, you know, for just a murder that was no one important, you know, right. no one famous or whatever. So this was kind of unusual, but he wanted he wanted to do, you know, really it's, attention grabbing. So he sort stuff. of sens thought it was sensational enough and yeah. made it sensational. Mm -hmm. So Bennett Sr. got a scoop and conducted what is what appears to be the first ever newspaper interview hmm. with the the brothel matron Rosina Townsend, who's the one that discovered the body. Though some claim that that interview itself was a hoax. Okay. So this is the the kind of journalism or journalistic so sensational, sensational, right. yeah. And it, specifically, he didn't wait around for the news to happen. He tr he specifically pursued trying to make stories, basically. Mm. So, for instance, he offered... Uh, this is senior or junior? Senior still. Okay. So he published a notice offering a reward to any woman who, quote, will set a trap for a Presbyterian parson and catch one of them, and this is an exact quote, flagrante delicto. No, delicato. That's the whole thing is a quote? <laughs> yes. Right. Delicato is actually how he wrote it. So he doesn't know what the... He doesn't really know the no phrase. phrase. Anyways, <laughs> that, that just amused me. But yeah, so he, you know, this is like, you know, newspapers, tabloid newspapers do now paying for, you know, tawdry stories or, you know, phone hacking, you know, is the extreme right, right. end of that. But, um, uh, but that it's that kind of approach. Now, he also got some notoriety for improper descriptions of his relationship with his wife, which probably isn't as scandalous, wouldn't be as scandalous to us now as it was then. Uh, he apparently described her, her most magnificent figure. Pretty tame by today's standards. Yeah. <laughs> but, but at the time, I think that was, was not, respectable. not respectable. And he published details of their wedding and the birth of their son, James Gordon Bennett Jr. in 1841. So I guess too personal? I don't know. But it was apparently not the, the done thing. Now, Bennett Jr., who was generally known as just Gordon Bennett dis to distinguish him from his father, was even more notorious. He was a bit of a hedonist playboy sportsman type. Mm. Uh, he was particularly into road racing and yachting. So he's this kind of, yeah, okay, young, foolish guy. There are various Bennett Cups named after him. So he's still a recognized name in the sporting world today. And he's the one that sponsored Henry Morton Stanley to go search for David Livingston, which led to the famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume. 
But the sort of most scandalous thing that he's known for is for scuppering his own wedding by showing up at the party held by the father of his fiancée so drunk that he urinated in full view of the host and guests in either the fireplace or the grand piano, depending on whose account you... (laughs) Neither of which was acceptable to the father of his prospective bride, right? Or to the bride herself, perhaps. (laughs) Perhaps, yes. (laughs) So as a result, he never really married young. He eventually did get married, but he was it was towards the end of his life when he was 73. And he he married Baroness de Reuter, who is the widow of the son of Julius Reuter, who is the founder of the Reuters news agency. Right. And it was this younger Bennett, Gordon Bennett, who lies behind the British expletive Gordon Bennett, which is probably also a minced oath of gore blimey. Which is itself, itself a minced oath of God blind me. Right. So you couldn't say God blind me because that uses Na- the Lord's, Lord's name. name in vain. So gore blind me, but then that became obviously an too expletive strong. too. Yeah. So then Gordon Bennett is the even more watered down version. And because he was sort of notorious. Yeah, he did. Well, as I said, in his sporting capacity, he was responsible for all kinds of famous. No, I know, but that wouldn't be a reason for that wouldn't be a reason for using his name as an expletive. It's because he's notorious. But because he's notorious, yeah, not just that he's famous. Yeah. All right. So a few more details on the the Dreadnought hoax. Mm -hmm. That's the one with Virginia Woolf and her friends disguising themselves to uh, get a tour of the ship. So while studying at Cambridge, Horace Devere Cole, who is the, the main actor of that, of yeah. that, that uh, second hoax, uh, he became friends with Adrian Stephen, who is Virginia Woolf's brother. And the two started to get up to a number of minor pranks to entertain themselves. Their most elaborate was to pose as dignitaries from Zanzibar to enjoy an official reception from the mayor of Cambridge. So very similar very to similar. what they did Same later. idea. Yeah. yeah. And it was years later that they decided to pull off a more elaborate version of of the same prank, this time with some other Confederates involved. The stunt seems to have been responsible for launching into the public attention the loose collective of artists, writers, and other intellectuals known as the Bloomsbury Group, Mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf being the most famous of them. And it was sort of in keeping with their pacifism and rejection of Victorian values. So that's why it specifically targeted a warship, the Dreadnought, Mm -hmm. because it was a sort of pacifist stunt. It was to show the foolishness of the military. Yeah. So again, there's that idea of the spirit of the age, Mm -hmm. right? It Mm -hmm. it is has a kind of real It had a point. Point. Yeah. Or yeah, a connection anyway. Now a few more details on the Cock Lane ghost affair Mm -hmm. and a few others. Interestingly, there is a backstory to the Cock Lane ghost affair. William Kent and Fanny Lines were not legally able to be married as she was the sister of his now deceased wife. And that was and considered that was, yeah. incest at the time. Yeah. So they thus moved from Norfolk to London to take advantage of the relative anonymity of a big city. So nobody there knew, knew that she the, was the... Yeah. yeah. And therefore they could pose as a married couple. They didn't, they didn't actually marry in they London? They couldn't. They couldn't well, uh, well, I suppose they could illegally get married. Well, yeah. Like, yeah. I yeah. mean, if, if no one knew who the, their yeah. previous yeah. connection, they could have gotten married. I don't know that they did, but they were certainly posing as a married couple. They probably considered themselves married. Yeah. Now, while they were staying at the house of Richard Parsons, Fanny would hear an otherworldly scratching noise, which I said. She took it to be her sister's warning from beyond the grave of some great danger. Mm. This backstory and the mayhem of the Burners Street hoax, that's the one where they sent all the... Yeah workmen and deliveries and so forth, highlight the dramatic demographic changes going on in England in the 18th and 19th century. There was a staggering shift in population from the countryside into the urban areas. So again, that's Mm -hmm. the sort of the spirit of the age. And from the 18th century onwards, there was a dramatic overall rise in English population. And following that trend that was already there in the in the beginning of the 19th century, so at the start of the 19th century, there was something like one-fifth of the population living in cities. Mm-hmm. But by the end of the 19th century, it was more like three-quarters. Yeah. So going from one-fifth to three-quarters is massive. Yeah. And so... <laughs> at, at the same time as the population was also exploding. Also exploding in, overall. Yeah. So it's not surprising then that this would, you know, kind of play into things like hoaxes. Mm-hmm. And so this alarming kind of trend in demographics 
as well as the perceived threat of industrialization, is also one of the things that lies behind the uh, celebration of nature and the countryside in the Romantic poets and artists. So this also explains the Romantic's attraction to the medieval, which they saw as a kind of golden age of, you know, the rural, rural pastoral simplicity, world, yeah. Yeah. knights riding through idyllic countrysides. And their Simple, pure quests. peasants yeah. and all of that stuff. Which is why they were so ripe for the Ossian and Rowley forgeries. Mm -hmm. Because, because they, they wanted to this. find that yeah. sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, of course, it has a lot to do with the rise of nationalism and yes. in the 19th century yeah. and ethnic nationalism yeah. and that stuff. Yeah. And so another kind of thing at that in the 19th century was this sort of science versus superstition mm -hmm. tension, which lies behind the Piltdown Man and the Cottingley Fairy hoaxes right. that I yeah. talked about. Photography at the time was still relatively new, you know, by the mm -hmm. beginning of the 20th century. So perhaps it's not so surprising that people were easily fooled by photographs of cardboard cutout fairies. Right? Mm -hmm. This is it's miraculous anyways to have a photograph. Yeah, no, how, how, how can you be discerning about it when mm -hmm. you've barely seen such things at all? And it's interesting to note that the impact that near ubiquitous camera phones have had now on similar, you know, phenomena like UFOs or Bigfoot or Loch Ness yeah. Monster pictures, which were so, so much the rage in the, you know, middle of the 20th century. Uh, 60s and 70s in particular, 70s, when, when yeah. people started to have cameras, yeah. but not everywhere. Not everywhere. If one were to extrapolate from the frequency of such pictures before the camera phone, we surely would be flooded with evidence of the supernatural by now. Mm -hmm. But it obviously dropped off. Yeah. Suddenly, suddenly we stopped seeing UFOs as soon as we all had a camera in our pocket. Yeah. Funny so, that. Times change. So what, what hoaxes do you have to talk to us about? Well, there are lots of hoaxes to do with the ancient world of things like hoaxed, like the Piltdown Man, um, mm -hmm. you know, archaeological forgeries and stuff like that. But to be honest, I don't know a lot about a lot of those things. So I thought I'd leave that aside. And we don't have stories really about like just practical jokes, practical jokes. and, you know, ha 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 stuff from the ancient world of that sort. Though we do have jokes, like there's a joke book. And speaking of jokes that are not funny... <laughs> So many of them rely the the joke book the the one the earliest joke book we have is called the Philo Legos, mm -hmm. and it's just an anthology of jokes by arranged by sort of subject or or type, and really they're all jokes about stereotypes. So they're like the intellectual said this, and it's like somebody who thinks they're smart but is really stupid. Mm -hmm. An intellectual was trying to find a wife, and he did this this this, and you know, and or the, a lot of them are jokes about particular people from particular areas. Right. So they're clearly meant to be like stereotypes about how funny these people are and weird they are, but we don't know the reference. Like we don't know. It would be like, you know, a joke now about oh, I don't even want to say they're also offensive, but like a newfie joke in Canada or something like that. Right. right? Okay. That only makes sense if you know what the stereotype associated with a newfie is. Right. If you don't know what the supposed cultural trait is, then the joke is the joke, which is not that good to start off with, falls very flat. Right. And then there's like there's a bunch of jokes about eunuchs with hernias. Because, yeah, so, you know, like <laughs> a eunuch with a hernia went to <laughs> did this and, you know, a man with a hernia did this. And, and, right. and, and then somebody said that, you know, and like, anyway, they're not good jokes. Right. And there was a bunch of mother-in-law jokes. There's a bunch oh, of that like. goes back a long way. Yeah. So anyway, and, and there's a whole bunch of jokes. We talked about this when we talked about misogyny. There's a whole bunch of jokes about mm. the word, about a misogynist had to bury his wife. And right. somebody said, you know, so anyway, so there are some jokes but that's from the fourth century, the th third or fourth century, though the jokes probably go back a lot earlier. And we know about handbooks of jokes from earlier, but they don't survive. But there are a few things I would point to. There's two in particular from Athens that I suppose one could call hoaxes, though they had very particular purposes. So one of them is a, a hoax perpetrated by Pisistratus, who was a on and off again tyrant of Athens in the sixth century just towards the like just before the 5th century and he he has a long and complicated story so i'm not going to give all the story but at one point he'd been tyrant for a while and then he'd been driven out again and he wanted to get back in power he did a couple things first of all at one point to get in to power he wounded himself and his mules and drove his wagon into the marketplace with a story that he had escaped from his enemies who would have killed him as he was driving into the country so he employed the people to give him a guard and they did 
They gave him a guard of clubmen, and then he used those clubmen to beat people up until they made him tyrant. Oh my god. <laughs> So that's one. That was not the hoax that I was meaning to, but that's the kind of thing he did. All right. But then he got driven out again because th there was a lot of partisans. It wasn't so much that he was bad. When I say tyrant, that just means a man who seizes power. It right. doesn't mean he was. He wasn't. In fact, Pisistratus was fine as a ruler, I think. But there was a lot of different aristocratic families vying for power. So a mm -hmm. different set of families sort of got together and drove right. him out again. So then he wants to come back in. He makes an alliance. And this is how Herodotus tells the story. He says... When this offer was accepted by Pisistratus, who agreed on these terms with Megacles, they devised a plan to bring Pisistratus back, which, to my mind, was so exceptionally foolish that it is strange, since from old times the Hellenic stock has always been distinguished from foreign by its greater cleverness and its freedom from sil silly foolishness, that these men should devise such a plan to deceive Athenians, said to be the subtlest of the Greeks. There was in the Paeanian deem a woman called Phaea, three fingers short of six feet four inches in height, and otherwise too well formed. This woman they equipped in full armor and put in a chariot, giving her all the paraphernalia to make the most impressive spectacle, and so drove into the city. Heralds ran before them, and when they came into town and proclaimed as they were instructed, Athenians, give a hearty welcome to Pisistratus, whom Athena herself honors above all men, and is bringing back to her own Acropolis. So the heralds went about proclaiming this, and immediately the report spread in the deems that Athena was bringing Pisistratus back, and the townsfolk, believing that the woman was the goddess herself, worshipped this human creature and welcomed Pisistratus. <laughs> and then he was made, wow, and, and it worked, <laughs> according to Herodotus. And I mean, we may have other sources mm. for this too. So, <laughs> it's a so, zany I mean, scheme. I know, I, I don't know if that counts as a hoax exactly. It's a zany scheme. But <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like it sort of was was in keeping a little bit with yeah. with with this. I know, and it and I mean, I think we all stand with Herodotus there and thinking, huh? Why did that <laughs> work? How did people believe this? <laughs> you know, there may have been other political things going on that we don't know. But anyway, so there you go. Hmm. So that was one I thought I would tell you about, and I will uh, I'll put a link to that passage in Herodotus in the notes just for your edification, should you wish it. The other one, which is less funny, though well, it's got its funny moment, and may well have been, it, it was equally probably political in, in sense, not so much a hoax, maybe a practical joke, though not maybe a joke, is the mutilation of the Herms. Have you heard about that? I know what Herms that, are. Yeah, yes. So Herms are these statues, usually outside of homes in Greece, or at crossroads or in public squares, they're typically a sort of block of stone with the head of Hermes, the god, and genitals. Sometimes no genitals, sometimes just like basically genitals only. Right. <laughs> Not necessarily like particularly artistic. Mm -hmm. They're religious. Right. And they're sort of good luck figures. They're apotropaic. They drive away bad luck. And in 415, so this is during the Peloponnesian War, you know, the Peloponnesian War was very complicated, so I'm not going to even try to, try to explain what was going on. But Athens and Sparta are fighting, and Athens was about to send a large expedition off to Sicily to fight, to try to take Syracuse, the right. city of Syracuse. Again, I don't want to get into the ex explanation of why they were going to do this. And Right before the Sicilian expedition was due to set sail, in one night, all the herms in Athens were mutilated and damaged. Hmm. And this was seen as a very bad omen for right. the enterprise. And they posted rewards for inform you know informers, and they found that the expedition's commander, Alcibiades, or well, he, among others, was accused of and then convicted of having done this. Hmm. Alcibiades is also an exceptionally complicated figure in Athenian history, so I don't want to get into right. why. And and the expedition was also a spectacular failure. It did go ahead, but it was a spectacular failure. One could say because of the bad luck. One could also say because Alcibiades wasn't in charge and he was a good commander. Maybe he knew it was a bad, bad, idea. bad idea. It's it's very complicated so I don't want to, <laughs> and I'm not good at Peloponnesian history, right? but it was very famous. And there was, in uncovering the information about the mutilation of the Herms, they also found that at the same time, or in a connection with it, there had been a desecration of the Eleusinian Mysteries, 
by some men who had gotten involved or some people who were not supposed to be part of the mysteries in a private house. Right. So, you know, there was two two sort of counts of sacrilege against mm. Alcibiades and some other people uh, for which he was exiled. So not exactly a hoax, but it, I mean, it, sort of a prank right. in a way, right? Mm -hmm. What What could be seen as a prank, mm -hmm. but seems to have had political serious. and serious political motivation and serious repercussions yeah. but i mean it is a bunch of statues with genitals being mutilated yeah so it was kind of funny too <laughs> <laughs> so okay so those are the two sort of closest i could come to pranks or, mm -hmm. or hoaxes there are a couple of other instances of practical jokes Sort of, um, there's a couple of poems. I'm not going to read them, but Catullus sort of says, has a poem like, How dare you? I think I've read this one possibly before, but the one where he complains that somebody sent him a book of bad poetry for, as a Saturnalia uh, gift. Yes, right, right. Yeah. And he says, How dare you send me this? That's going to, you know, it's going to send carry me off. The poems are so bad. So the idea there is that that was a practical joke from his on his right. friend's part, right? A joke gift. Um, there's also another poem where he says somebody goes around stealing napkins, and you could see that he thinks he's very witty, but it's not very funny at all. So, you know, the idea of there being kind of practical jokes, mm. and that one of the ways you can tell if you're the in group or the out group is if you get the jokes right, right, and if you take the jokes in the right spirit too, right. which I think is actually, you know, is often one of the underlying purposes of practical jokes. Mm. It, it mark, you know, you play practical jokes on friends and on enemies. Right. They're different kinds of jokes, right. depending whether you're their friends or enemies. And, you know, that's why pranks and things are often associated with hazing mm. and with groups like frats or right. sports teams or, you know, because you're marking who's inside and outside, you know, um, honor societies and you know, all of these sorts of things. So I do think that that seems to be right. kind of what's there. There's also a Horace poem where he uh, complains that his that Mycenas, his patron, has had him to dinner and then fed him a whole bunch of garlic. And he talks about it as like this poison that he's been fed and how no one's going to come near him now. And <laughs> his guts are all twisted up and he's it's like Mycenas po you know, gave him... Circe's witch's brew or something like that. <laughs> um, so it sort of seems to be in this tradition of like a friend, a practical joke by a friend. Right. I also thought I remembered that Suetonius talks about practical jokes played by emperors, but you I would went, have thought Nero might be. I went and looked through and I mean, it sort of depends what you mean by jokes. Yeah. <laughs> so what we do have. He may have thought of them as funny, but well, he doesn't really. Oh, the emperor may have. Yeah. yeah, he does. Suetonius does mention like that Augustus liked to give, for instance, a Saturnalia presents, which of course mm. are meant to be sort of Joke trivial games. and jokey anyway. Yeah. But that like to some people he would give really valuable paintings, and to other people he would give like a handful of candles, and you know like mix it up and so you didn't never knew what you were going to get and he talks a little bit about some of the jokes that augustus liked to tell but they were just kind of verbal jokes he talks about caligula's sort of cruel pranks but right. the thing is both caligula and nero really what he sort of says is they devised new extraordinary means of killing people and i'm not sure that really counts as a practical joke <laughs> like <laughs> it was sort of i think what i was remembering right. but i don't know that i would call those you know, like things like calling someone to you and praising him excessively and then turning around and having him executed, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> which the emperor in question may have found funny. But, but yeah, exactly. I don't know that. It, and then and then making everybody else laugh and things like that. Or, and then the only other is that uh, Vespasian was quite fond of jokes as a hmm. whole. Um, and he his most famous joke is his deathbed joke. Dear me, I seem to be turning into a god. Which is pretty good, right? It's a pretty good last line yeah. when you're an emperor who is literally going to be deified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but that's not a practical no. joke. That's just a joke. So, yeah, that's as, that's as much as I could find. There may well be other stuff, mm -hmm. of course, but I couldn't couldn't offhand think of other good instances. Well, I have a few hoaxes that I I didn't put in the video. But I want to mention them now, mainly because they're good examples of that whole spirit of the age thing. Mm -hmm. So one hoax that wasn't in the video is about is this 18th century story about the rabbit babies of Mary Toft. 
Oh, I yes, I remember you telling me about this when you were doing the research. It's, pretty it's really yeah, yeah, it's kind of gross. Good. So, so you know, turn this off if you are weak stomach. I won't go into <laughs> immense detail. Good. But basically, she appeared to give birth to rabbits. This was accomplished by inserting rabbits or parts of rabbits into Mary Toff's birth cavity after she had a miscarriage. Now, what's most notable about this, I'm not going to go into any more detail about the hoax itself, but what's notice, notable about this hoax is the number of highly respected physicians of the day who were fooled by it. Yeah, which is bizarre, really. Yes. So it became the subject of scandal and satirical mockery, most notably by the famous artist and pictorial satirist William Hogarth, who was critical of the gullibility of the so-called men of science in particular, and of the general public more broadly at the time. And he produced a satir he, he produced various satirical cartoons about hoaxes of the day, such as uh, that of Mary Toft, also Scratching Fanny. So, for instance, and, and we'll put images of these on the, the show notes of the Hogarth. Right. So, one was the Cuniculari, or the Wise Men of Godly Man in Consultation. Okay. Godly Man, I guess, is a place name. This was from 1726, and it illustrated the Mary Toft story of the babies. Another is, is called Credulity, Superstition, and Fanaticism, 1762, featuring references to both Mary Toft and Scratching Fanny, as well as other contemporary examples of secular and religious credulity. Mm -hmm. And they're quite interesting to look at. Another hoax that's worth mentioning is also tied to Edgar Allan Poe. Right. So Poe was quite interested in hoaxes, not only perpetrating them, but debunking them. Mm -hmm. And he attempted to, to do that with the famous chess playing Turk automaton, the mechanical Turk. Right. Which probably a lot of people know about that, but they may not know that Poe that Poe was involved in debunking it. Mm -hmm. So it appeared to be a mechanical device that could play and win against living opponents. Chess, yes. Chess. And as Poe suspected, there was an expert chess player hidden inside the machine. Though it wasn't, it wasn't as he imagined inside the body of the Turk itself, but instead, uh, in a sort of you know underneath the mechanism, mm -hmm. who was making the actual moves by means of a sort of pantograph like connection to the. the so Turkish there was interesting mechanic and mechanical, mechanical stuff thing. going yeah. on. It's yeah. just not what it, it was saying. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't artificial intelligence or anything. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, the mechanical Turk came with the Industrial Revolution when machines were beginning to replace the labor of people. And the idea of actually an actual thinking machine played into the fears people might have of being replaced by machines. Yeah. The spirit of the age. The industrialization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, that mechanical Turk was invented by Wolfgang von Kempelen, who also designed the speaking machine that Charles Wheatstone constructed and improved uh, and proved on that I mentioned in the Erasmus Darwin video, which will eventually become a podcast. But <laughs> who knows when? Yeah. So Poe used the name von Kempelen in another of his hoaxes. He published a newspaper article claiming that German chemist, a, a German chemist named Baron von Kempelen, had discovered the alchemical process to transform lead into gold in hopes of dissuading the inevitable gold rush that was about to ensue after reports of gold in California. Ah, so to sort of distract he was trying attention, to, yeah. basically, and say, yeah. oh, gold isn't so big a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And one might also imagine that this was a swipe at the creator of the mechanical Turks, Turk, since he used the name. Right, right. So. Now, there are potentially medieval uh, hoaxes, such as Marco Polo. So some scholars believe that Marco Polo's travels were a hoax, that he never actually went to China. That's true, right. And instead based his book on secondhand accounts. And the sort of evidence to this is the sort of omissions and inconsistencies in his record that make it seem yeah. suspect. Now, there's a lot of debate on this text, and it's ultimately probably unprovable one way or the other. But certainly, you know, there are other clear examples of hoaxes in the med medieval period, in particular, faked holy relics. Yeah, right. There's a huge yeah, trade in yeah. fake holy relics. You can imagine how easy it would be to like fake a finger bone of a saint and how lucrative it would be for the church yeah. to have that yeah. because people would come and visit it and leave money in the donation box. So there was this massive trade in probably most 90% were fake relics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Leaving aside the complicated question of what a 
real, real relic, relic is. is. But anyway, oh, yes. leaving that. But it, yeah. yeah, but I literally just faked mm-hmm. like a rabbit bone or something. Yeah. yeah. It's often joked that there are enough pieces of the true cross to build Noah's Ark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and not to mention how many pieces of... <laughs> I was going to get to that too. But yes, the most amusing example is of this is the Holy Prepice, supposedly the foreskin of Christ, uh, which we talked about in episode 25, 12 days. Yes. I'm sorry, but if you have the same stories, <laughs> you can't be surprised if I'm going to know which stories you're yes. going to come to. <laughs> well, perhaps today the most famous medieval related hoax, it's not a hoax that happened in the Middle Ages, but it is about the Middle Ages, is the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I can't do an, a podcast about hoaxes and not okay. talk about this, but so... Da Vinci Code author Dan Brown seems to have been taken in by a kind of crazy pseudo history book about the continued bloodline of Christ that was co-written by Doctor Who scriptwriter Henry Lincoln, if that gives you any idea of the level of fantasy involved here, (laughs) called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. That book itself was based on supposed evidence, which was in fact created in a surrealist hoax that was perpetrated by one Pierre Plantard uh, and his confederates in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, according to both books, Dan Brown's book and Holy Holy Grail, there was a secret society known as the Priory of Sion and the Knights Templar who preserved the Holy Grail, but that the Holy Grail wasn't the cup of Christ, but actually a secret bloodline of Christ and Mary Magdalene, which ran through the Merovingian royal family in France in the Middle Ages, right up to the present day. Mm. So supposedly there were secret messages and clues to its existence hidden in art and architecture of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, including Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at least the convolutedness of Dan Brown's plots lives up to the convolutedness of the trails of this hoax. Yeah. But <laughs> well, and I mean, it's the question is, was he taken in by it or did he just think it was a good story? I mean, yeah, he, it's his... hard to know. But the, the writers of Holy Blood, Holy Grail certainly were taken in by it. Yes. Yes. Now, at the beginning of Dan Brown's book, he says this is real history. Yeah, I know. But whether he meant that or not, but he seems to still claim claim that. Well, isn't that in part so that he has the claim of truth against being sued, sued by the writers of because Holy Blood, if it's Holy fiction yeah. and somebody else if if he's if it's a real thing yeah. nobody owns the story right but if he's based it off Holy Blood Holy Grail because they did sue him they didn't did they? try to sue him they and tried they lost. to sue him yeah but and so if he admitted that he didn't believe in it and it was he knew it was fiction then it would then be he would have had plagiarism. to have taken it from yeah. them and it would be plagiarism yeah so I mean. Far be it from me to (laughs) accuse him of knowingly fabricating something, but like, you know, Mm -hmm. who knows? Who knows? It's very hard to to know what he actually thinks. But yes, it's not true. It's really (laughs) an important point here. Well, and this is the thing. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's true from the point of view of writing fiction. Yeah. No, who cares? But um, but when he claims it is. claims it's true. Yeah, that's the problem. Well, apparently Plantard was trying to fabricate a connection between himself and the medieval French Merovingian royal line. And he denounced the whole thing, you know, as, as fake and fiction and everything once the whole bloodline of christ thing came in into it right because that was not what he was that was trying not to do. what he was trying to do so he said no this was all made up because he would have thought perhaps that was rather more blasphemous than he wanted to yeah. be among other things and that was introduced by lincoln and his co-writers and holy blood holy right, grail right so if you believe him then it it certainly it's was definitely a hoax. made up yeah so there's no truth to it at all right <laughs> Now, there's an interesting parallel between this whole thing um, and the hoax of the Vestiarium Scoticum, which is a supposedly old manuscript that established the provenance of clan tartans in Scotland. Right, 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 right. Which are is a hoax. not yes. old. They are, in fact, 19th, uh, 18th century? 19th uh, century. 19th or maybe 18th. Actually, I, I think they remember. might be 18th century. Mm-hmm. So this hoax was perp- perpetrated by John and Charles Allen. Yes, yeah, so mu- I guess it must have been late 18th century because they were trying to claim that they were grandsons of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Right. Now, it's all made up, but 
Nevertheless, many of the tartan patterns are still considered to be genuinely old and therefore official. The ones that they, that they list in that yeah. manuscript, yeah. Yeah. So as with the Da Vinci Code, which generated considerable tourist traffic to the sites mentioned in the book, you know, sometimes hoaxes get out of hand and take on a life of their own. It seems that the spirit of our current age is such that we want to believe in ancient or secret origins to things. And, you know, with the easy availability of vast amounts of information, it appears perhaps surprisingly to make it easier to spread misinformation. Yeah, yeah. So that we're often taken in by conspiracy theories or other such hoaxes like the whole Dan Brown, mm -hmm. Holy Blood thing. And yeah. many more, much, much, much more much damaging worse. ones yeah. that are going around right now. I mean, let's let's just decide not to get into too much of the modern yeah, the political stuff. ones yeah. yes yeah if only our gullibility was just the result of too many tom collinses oh god uh, yeah it, it seems to be you <laughs> much know, more deeper. deeply ingrained than that <laughs> yeah, much deeper than that now there's one i mean there obviously are academic hoaxes and one of my favorite academic hoaxes is the fictitious theologian franz bibfeld <laughs> I mean, I would say the name gives it away, except there were some really weird names. So, yes. yeah. <laughs> so it began as a, an invented footnote, Franz Bibfeld. Okay. No such scholar existed. Right. Uh, it was in a student term paper. But it sort of grew into this enormous in-joke with various actual publications analyzing the work of Bibfeld and all of this sort of thing. Right. So, I mean, the whole field now knows it's a, it's a joke, but they kind of keep Play it going. along for, yeah. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about hoaxes and spirit of the age and academic hoaxes in general mm -hmm. uh, i have to mention and we you know we can talk more about this or not as we feel but i have to mention the socal affair oh yes so this was the original Speaking one was of things that things, i yeah. don't really want to talk about because yes. it's just so depressing yes well, so-called hoax is what it's so known hoax. as yes so it was perpetrated the first one was perpetrated by alan sokal in 1996 he wrote a fake article called transgressing the boundaries toward a transformative hermeneutics of quantum gravity and sent it into the journal social text it was basically an attack on postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a more recently a follow up hoax. At the point of it, people don't, you have to explain that. Okay. So he sent it in and it was accepted. Yes. That was the point. He was, was trying to get it he accepted. He was trying to prove that, uh, that, that enough that... jargon could fool uh, a journal mm -hmm. into publishing something that something was, that, that had was no nonsense. basis on anything. Yeah. yeah. And it was accepted and it was published. And therefore, he thought he'd proven his point. Yes. In fact, the, the, uh, that journal didn't use peer review at that time. So mm -hmm. no one actually looked at it. Well, not using peer review does not mean no one looks at no. it. I suppose the editor may have glanced Wait. at it. but Well, not glanced at it. I mean, not use, peer review is a very specific yes. blind no expert, process. No expert on that subject read it. Right. Is the point. So... It doesn't really prove it, anything. Oh, no, I'm not saying that so-called hoax proved anything in particular. I'm just right. saying that there's a vast difference between did not use blind peer review and nobody looked at it. They just published anything that was sent in. Mm. There is a very big difference. But right. There's lots of good ways of doing publication that don't use necessarily peer blind review. peer review. Yeah. So, as I said, there was a follow-up uh, hoax known as the Grievance Studies hoax or affair in 2017 and 2018 in which a series of articles were submitted to several journals. Again, this was an attack on postmodernism, particularly queer, race, gender, sexuality, cultural studies mm -hmm. subjects. In fact, I think the majority of them were rejected. Yeah, but most of them were rejected. Some of them were, a, a good number of them were sent back and asked for revisions mm -hmm. or, you know, people put lots and lots of work into reading mm -hmm. these things. It's one of the things that makes me angriest about it. So, But some of them were published. Some of them were published, yeah. And again, I think this is another example of, you know, the spirit of the age. Mm -hmm. It reflects a distrust of the humanities by many in the scientific community, for one thing. Yeah, the, those people were also in the humanities. Yes. The people who were running it. Who were running the hoax, yeah. Or in social studies, at least. Yeah. Uh, not social studies, social sciences. Social studies is high school, isn't it? Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's, a, it's. I mean, it's both sort of scientific arrogance, but also the arrogance of certain schools of thought within those. Mm -hmm. It reflects divisions in academic approaches. Yeah. Let's put it to 
to be neutral about it. That's what it reflects. Yeah. I do not feel neutral on this topic. No. So, <laughs> But it's also a reflection of sort of political and ideological uh, yes, battlegrounds. Yes, very much so. And it's this idea of, you know, kind of right wing or whatever, hiding behind the guise of science or rationalism. We're objective and you guys are just biased. Yeah. That's the argument. Look at us. We're so objective. We're so objective we call something grievance studies. Because that's an objective name for something. To be honest, I don't really want to talk. Uh, let me just say, I think it was it was a hoax. It was perpetrated yeah. as a hoax. It was they tried to claim it was a social. It was an actual t study, a scientific study. Though they backpedaled immediately on that when people pointed out that if it was a scientific study, did they get ethics board approval? Right. Did they get any? Was it in any way an actual scientific study? Could you? Explain well, was, the scientific no methodology. There was no methodology. There was no control. I mean, you don't need a control. The, not all scientific studies have controls. But there was there was no method to mm -hmm. it. There was no methodology. And any kind of scientific experiment that involves human participants, which this obviously did, yeah, yeah. needs to have ethics approval and doesn't have that. And in fact, some people were being investigated at their universities for having done this because mm -hmm. and then they immediately said oh no it's not a scientific study that's not a, what it is well if it isn't a science scientific study then what the heck does it prove it proves nothing mm -hmm. does it prove that sometimes sometimes bad papers are published in journals yes no one has ever disputed that of course is that part of the process yes you publish and if people other people if you try if you make it that's what seems like a decent argument and you can get it published, then if people disagree with it, they write it responds. responses yeah. and rebuttals. And then they and it, it, it shows a complete lack of understanding of how scholarship progresses in the humanities, which is not through I write a, pub, a paper. It proves a point. We tick that off as a box and we move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. You advance arguments, you give your supporting evidence, and then other people say, no, I don't actually take that interpretation. I don't think that makes sense. And then they advance arguments, and they give their evidence, and then other people say, oh, between those two, well, I think this makes sense or that doesn't make sense. And that's how knowledge accumulates in the humanities. Plus, it was put out in complete bad faith. Journal editors are not on the lookout for people submitting papers in bad faith. Mm -hmm. They are on the lookout for people submitting papers in good faith that are not necessarily very good yet mm -hmm. or at all. And so a whole bunch of unpaid people, some put of whom are graduate students yeah. and other precarious people, put an awful lot of work and in good faith thought, huh, this doesn't seem like it has a lot of an argument or this evidence is not very good here, but you know what? Maybe this is a student. Remember, it's blind peer review. They don't know who it is who's doing it. Maybe this is someone who doesn't really know very much yet. And they, a lot of people that came out had sent back detailed suggestions as to how to improve the work, had, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then the, the authors of the hoax claimed that that was evidence that, oh, my God, they took us seriously. They must be idiots. What it proves is that these are good people with the intention to help other people think more clearly about the things that they thought mm -hmm. in all good conscience. But, oh, it just it makes me so angry. It proves nothing. It confirms the biases of those who think that they're objective. It misunderstands and misrepresents the entire entire process of accumulating knowledge and advancing knowledge in the humanities and it took advantage of people and their desire to be good colleagues and it wasted so much time and so much goodwill it makes me so angry so yeah spirit of the age indeed mm -hmm. and exactly i mean that's the kind of well mean spiritedness that is behind so many practical jokes too. Yeah. I mean, I hate practical jokes. For the record, I maybe it's a little late in this podcast to mention it. I really dislike April <laughs> Fool's Day. <laughs> I am not a fan of April Fool's Day at all. I have never participated in jokes on April Fool's Day. I hate being the butt of jokes on April Fool's Day. We have never really mentioned to our children that it's a thing. <laughs> no. I mean, they've kind of I'm come sure to gather it, it, but from... we've never done anything mm. in our household. I know you. I know there are amu like amusing, non mean spirited jokes, and there are mm -hmm. ways to do it that are fine and are perfectly funny and that don't harm people. I know it can be done, but personally, I just don't. I don't enjoy it. So yeah. So that was me not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I did suggest that I could, you know, vet some of these 
with you before, but you wanted me to... to... No, you got my answer. Yep. (laughs) You got my response. You you got my unedited and unfiltered (laughs) and unplanned response to it. Uh, So anyway, I would say I'll put a link to the stuff about the grievance study hoax in the notes, but I'm not going to, because you you can look it up if you want to. It's easy to find, so... But I don't want to, (laughs) so I won't. I don't think either of our fields were particularly targeted by it. No. And so this is not defensiveness on my own behalf. It really isn't, though. I mean, I do study gender and I'm interested in race and stuff, but it's, I just think it was atrocious. I don't think, I don't know how anybody who thinks of themselves as participating in a scholarly enterprise could think that that was an appropriate thing to do. I just do not. Mm-hmm. I can't see that these People have much of well, maybe the scary thing is that they do have a future in the world of academia. But... Oh, they have. They have. There, many of them are in fairly well-established positions. Mm. I, well, to be honest, I don't even know that. I just, I don't want to spend my time and energy on them. They make me so angry. Anyway, so thanks for ending that on a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? That's it. Well. Times Who's were... the real April Fools yeah. now, eh? <laughs> Times were better when, when you know, the joke was that Tom Collins guy. He's, he's, he's a real bad cad. Ma- <laughs> he's no, bad mouthing you. Go, he, he's over in that pub over there. <laughs> let's go back to that. <laughs> oh, let's go try to cage a cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my Tom Collins is gone, and I think we're done. <laughs> So get in touch if you have any answers or explanations for any of the things we mentioned or asked about or want to tell us about April Fool's. If you have an April Fool's joke that you've played that was a good one and wasn't mean, do feel free to share it with me. Maybe you can change my mind on the holiday. (laughs) (laughs) And in the meantime, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hi, I'm Mark. If you want. <laughs> All right. Fine. No, no. no if you want. That's just... fine. <laughs> it's kind of cheesy Extremely joke. cheesy. <laughs>